Well, good morning, everyone. Who's excited to be at church today? It is great having all of you. I'm glad that you are here. Uh, We are starting this new series. We started last week on prayer. And we're really looking into the Lord's Prayer. Last week, we learned why do we pray. This week, we're starting to look at how do we pray. And over the next five weeks, we're going to be taking line by line the Lord's Prayer. This prayer that so many of us have memorized, have been reciting maybe for the entirety of your life. And we don't want to just recite it, we want to understand it. Uh, We want to internalize it. We want to make sure that as we uh, understand this is how Jesus said to pray, that we're praying in a way that lines up with what he was teaching his disciples. And so today, we are going to get into the Lord's Prayer. But let me ask you, is anyone out there in a season right now in life where you're like, I need prayer? We always need prayer, but you're like, I am desperate. Like, I, I need prayer right now. Uh, the McMillans are in a weird space. My family, it's been a weird couple of weeks. Three weeks ago, uh, my wife had made a big old thing of meat sauce. She is an incredible cook. And when she makes her, her meat sauce, like, my, my family gets excited you know, like there's, a, there, there's just a sense of anticipation. And so my, my wife made her, her meat sauce and, and she was going into the garage to put the meat sauce into our garage fridge because every good Italian family needs to have another fridge for their meat sauce. You know what I mean? It's just too big to go in the regular fridge. So, so she has it and she's barefoot and she's on her way in the garage. It's only three steps down, but, but she tripped on an extension cord as she was going into the garage, and it completely pulled her foot one way because she has a big old pot of meat sauce. She trips down the stairs, and then with that same foot, then crushes it on the concrete. Now, here's the impressive thing. She wants me to make sure everyone knows this. As she was falling, she saved the sauce. (laughs) Saved the sauce, but broke her foot. Destroyed. Her foot. I mean, this thing is in bad shape. So last Friday, we were at the hospital, and my wife ended up getting surgery on her foot. Let me show you a quick picture. Uh, she is now Wolverine from the X-Men. Um, she has 18 screws, three plates, two rods, and a reconstructed ligament in her foot. Needless to say, our life has been a little crazy over the last couple of weeks. Now, here's the thing. I'll just be blunt with you guys. I mean, we're family, right? I don't have to, I don't have to pretend. My wife runs our house, all right? She, she runs our house. She's, she's a, I'm in charge of the church. She's in charge of the house. That, we, we divide and conquer. That's been our philosophy since we first got married. So needless to say, me and my boys are doing things we never would normally <laughs> do. Like, I'm learning things I didn't know were real. Like, for example, do you know that we have this one room off the kitchen that has these two metal boxes? And if you put dirty clothes in these metal boxes, they come out clean. What? All right, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. But, but we are. We're doing all of these things. And the reality is it's going to take weeks before my wife can put pressure on her foot, and it's going to take months until she can start to walk normal. This is a a long-haul moment for us. Now, I say all of this because, first, pray for your pastor, all right? Like, you should pray for her foot to be healed, but pray for your pastor. You know what I'm saying, gentlemen, all right? Pray for us, but when you have a moment like this and you suddenly realize your complete dependency on someone, that you've just been overlooking certain things for a long period of time, you, you kind of realize, like, all right, this, this is a lot right here. Now, I knew my wife did a lot before this. Don't get me wrong. I've always been appreciative. But now I know that my wife does a lot because we're doing all of the things that she would normally do. And as I taught last week on prayer, prayer changes us, and it helps us to see just what God is actually doing, the work he's doing all around us all of the time. Because so often, we're just going about our life, not realizing all the things that God is up to. 
what he wants to do through us and ultimately where he wants to take us in our life. But God wants us to pray daily. God wants us to pray not just when things are bad, but to have a recognition of what he is doing all of the time. So that no matter what, we're putting our focus on him, we're thanking him, we're praising him, and we understand that we're relying on him for everything that is happening in our life. Amen? To be consciously depending on him for everything. <clears throat> Prayer's critical to making sure this happens. And so Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. God bless you. <laughs> he taught his disciples how to pray. And today we're going to see the first part of this prayer. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. <clears throat> we find the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 and then a more abridged version in Luke chapter 11. And the prayer as we know it comes from Matthew chapter 6. And we're only going to look at one line at a time. And I think you're going to be amazed at how much information each of these lines have. <clears throat> so this is what Jesus says, chapter 6, verse 9. He says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And the prayer starts with this idea of our Father who art in heaven. And so here, right off the bat, I'm just going to give you the, the ending at the beginning of this message. When Jesus is teaching them how to pray, he starts with the key focus of prayer. The key emphasis of when we pray, what the, the body and the point of our prayer ultimately should be. And here it is, it's not us. That our prayer isn't at first or ever really about us. Now we're part of it, but, but it's about something far greater. Our prayer is really always about him. He's the consistent thread of everything that we pray for. How often when we pray, we rush to our needs. We rush to our daily bread. That's where we start off, most of us, right? Like we go right to the daily bread. Like we're ordering in a restaurant. Like, yeah, God, I, uh, I really would like a double cheeseburger. Help my marriage. Give me some more money. Heal my bad knee and give me a side of fries. Like that's, that's kind of our prayers that we lift up to God. Yet Jesus wants to make sure that we don't come to prayer that way. He wants to make sure that when we pray, we know what the real focus of our prayer ultimately should be. And so he says this. Don't lose this first line in the scope of the Lord's prayer. He starts with our Father who art or are in heaven. Let's start by understanding our Father. I think for many, thinking about God as our Father feels very natural to us. It's normal for, for many Christians, or those even new to faith, because even when we think about the Trinity, like we, we have the Trinity, we have these three names for God in the Trinity. We have the what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and so if you know the Trinity, or you, you kind of have that as part of a prayer, like you, you get this conceptual idea that God is the Father. You have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Holy Spirit. So thinking about God as Father is very common for us as Christians. But that wasn't really the case in Judaism and in the Old Testament. Now the idea of God as a Father wasn't completely absent but the few times that the Old Testament talks about God being a father, it's more of a, of a descriptive term than a relational term. I'll give you a quick example. Isaiah 63, 16. Man, my voice is shot, and I haven't even yet started cheering for Taylor Swift. That's so weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's already, and it's, it's not even, man. <sighs> I have her winning by a spread of 10, by the way, if you're... You're into sports. Isaiah 63, sorry, <laughs> 16. Isaiah says this. He says, but you are our father. He's talking to God. 
Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us, you, Lord, are our father, our redeemer from of old is your name. Now, there's a lot going on in this, this text of Isaiah. I just want you to, to focus on the father part because he's addressing God as father. But again, this is more of a factual concept for the one who created them and made a covenant with Israel and made Israel his chosen people. But no Jewish person would pray to our father. That was unheard of. You wouldn't pray to our father as a reference to God. That's way too casual. That would actually have come off irreverent. That would have been uh, uh, looked down upon, deeply frowned upon. Like, you don't call Yahweh our father. Like, who are you? How dare you? That, that wasn't part of the understanding of God. So when Jesus is teaching this, here's what I want you to get. All right, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Covenant, New Covenant. When Jesus is teaching this, this is a completely different way of thinking about God. This is revolutionary, what we take so naturally and so commonplace. Now, as we learn from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, the other place where we find the version of the Lord's Prayer, the, the word there for Father is this Aramaic term called Abba, A-B-B-A. Abba, not the band. God, the Father. And it's important to realize that Father in this term is an intimate term. It's a special relationship. It's not just the biological reality that this person has helped conceive you. This is like a father biologically. It's, it's not that. It's the relational aspect of Father. Yet when we hear the word Father, we don't, uh, we're just such a lax culture like, most of us don't use the word father in reference to our, our fathers, right? Like, that, that sounds like we're, we're watching Downton Abbey or something. Like, whenever I say father, I feel like I need to have a little uh, a British accent, like, father. <laughs> father, can I have some porridge, father? You know, when I hear father, I, I think the expression, children should be seen, not heard. That's what a father would say. Now, in our, our culture, most of us don't use the term father. We use the term dad. That's really more of our, our language. Like, when I think of my dad growing up, I called him dad. I never called him father. Like, that would have felt weird. Like, father. <laughs> May I enter my room, father? Like, it just, it, right? It, it doesn't, it feels a little, little distant. Actually, I even called my dad dad. I called my dad Trip most of his life, which was his first name, just because we had such a weird relationship. So even calling him dad seems weird. I'm like, hey, Trip. That's how we rolled. Disrespectful, maybe. But it was who we were. <laughs> just how we rolled. I say all that because father here is probably closer to the way we use the term dad. That's the reason I bring that up. Because it's not just this position, it's relationship. Does that make sense? And so it's kind of like us saying, hey, dad, father. It's a relational term. And get this, Jesus didn't have to say our father. Think about that for a moment. He didn't have to say our father. He's talking to the disciples. <clears throat> he, he could have easily said, hey, guys, let's pray to my father. <laughs> right? He's, he's my father. He's not your father, but Jesus doesn't say my father. He says our follower. And as Jesus' followers, we are brought into this relationship where we get to call God, God, our Father. Jesus is inviting us into a special relationship with his heavenly Father. How cool is that? Amen. We're brought into that. We learn a little bit more about this theologically in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Let, let me read this for you. Chapter 8, verse 14. <clears throat> it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God, and as we talked a little bit about last week, anytime someone puts their faith in Jesus, asks for the forgiveness of their sin, they receive the Holy Spirit in that moment. So the Holy Spirit's now helping to guide our life. So he says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought, you, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, by Jesus, we cry, Abba, there's that word again, 
Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. He says the Holy Spirit will reinforce this to you, that you are, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, a child of God. He's not just your God. He's not just a distant God. He's a relational God. And we get to say to him, Abba, Father, like you are my spiritual dad. I get to come before God in this posture and in this way because Jesus, as a result of him and the forgiving of our sins, we get adopted into the family of God. It's amazing how God loves us and cares for us and desires this relationship with us. Amen? Amen. Come on now. That is better than the Super Bowl right there. I'm just letting you know. That is amazing. Now, whenever we start talking about God the Father, I, I, I do want to just say I understand for some people there is, there is a little bit of a struggle here. I was super blessed in my life. My dad, as I shared last week, was one of my best friends. He was my mentor. He, he, he and I had a great relationship. Um, you know, I mean, nine years without my dad. I can't even believe that at this point. So when I, when I pray to my heavenly father, I had a great earthly representation of fatherhood. I just did. And so when I pray to God the Father, I'm like, man, I could have gone to my dad for anything. My dad had so much grace for me. I mean, yeah, sure, he grounded me, and he used to use the belt. They did that back in the day, don't worry. You know, that's just how they parented 40-some years ago, but... But man, my dad and I, I just had such a great relationship. So, so coming to my heavenly father is, is, is not an emotional uh, challenge for me. But I also know that's not everyone's reality. You know, some people didn't have a father present. Uh, maybe they passed away or they were absentee or maybe even worse, you had a bad example of fatherhood. There's a lot of wounds attached to the phrase father. And I say that because I've met a lot of Christians over the years who, who struggle thinking about coming before God. They, they struggle with prayer. Uh, they, they struggle with trust because of an earthly representation of Father. And if that is you, first, I am sorry for the reality of that part of your life. But I, I want to challenge you, if, and especially if you've never made that connection before, that right now for the first time, you're like, epiphany, like, wait a second, that makes a lot of sense. I want you to know that when it comes to our Heavenly Father, God wants to redeem the term and title Father in your life. He wants to redeem it. It is the term that he wants you to know he fully fulfills what Father is meant to be. He is the perfect Father with the perfect love. And I would even encourage you to maybe start praying, God, help me to to overcome these, these, these Father wounds and issues that I have so that when I come before you and I pray to you, I know that I can rejoice in calling you my father, knowing that you are perfect and you are complete and that you fulfill everything that I had not yet seen on this planet. Does that make sense? And it's okay to be like, God, help me to heal with this so that there's no distortion of you based on what I've experienced in my life. Because we get to come before God in the most ideal, perfect sense, and say, God, you are my father. Our father. Then Jesus went on to say, who art in heaven. So we go from this very familiar relational language of father to instantly remembering the greatness of our God who is in heaven. Our God who is in heaven, our God who created heaven, our God who is above all things, our God who is uncomprehendable in his greatness and his majesty in in his might. He's not simply our father, he's our father who art in heaven, (laughs) far above anything that we could ever fathom or understand. I want to give you a quick glimpse of heaven because I, I, I want you to remember that in this prayer, we're also talking about the majesty of our God. Isaiah had this moment where God allowed him to be before him in heaven, before his throne. And it says this, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. 
It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. <clears throat> Above him were the seraphim, a, a type of angel, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another. I want you to picture this moment of God on his throne, and the seraphim around him singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who uh, the whole earth is full of his glory. And this moment that we cannot fathom, so much so that, that Isaiah was like, I'm ready to die right now. I, I can't deal with it. I'm too sinful. And then God purifies him so he can even be in this, this moment as Isaiah continues on. I want you to just picture that this is the God we're talking about. This God in heaven whose seraphim are around him singing in his greatness and his majesty and in his might. Yes, he is your heavenly father. But don't forget, he is your heavenly father, Right? your father who art in heaven. Which brings us to the second part of this line. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's not a word we use too often, <laughs> hallowed. It means to treat as holy or revered or honored. You're not putting this on the individual. You're not making them this, but you're acknowledging <clears throat> that they are. You're, you're uh, acknowledging their holiness. You're revering who they are. You're, you're honoring them. That's what hallowed be your name. You're saying your name is so holy. Your name is so majestic. Your name is so awesome. Your name is so amazing. Hallowed be your name. You see, God's holiness is one of his prime characteristics. And so as we pray in the name of the Father, we're also recognizing his holiness. Isaiah 29, 23 tells us this, keep God's name holy. Keep God's name holy. To realize it's not just any name. You're not like talking to Bob, right? Like, hey, Bob, how you doing today? Good, how are you? Great, you know? You're not just talking to Cindy. Like, hey, Cindy, what's up? Pound, all right. That it's not just buddy, buddy. Like, yes, he is our father, but, but as we talk to God, we cannot forget Hallowed be your name. You know, in our culture, names don't have the same significance that they do in many cultures, including Judaism. For us, names are just identifiers. For the most part, there's a few of you out there who may care about the meaning of names, but that's, that's generally not how we name people, unless there's like a horrific attachment to that name, you know? Um, you know no one's naming their kid Hitler, Right? Right? Like, it, you're not going to do that because it's like, that's horrific. Sorry, that just popped in my head. I should never say that again. I apologize. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, because there's such a horrific event. When we, when we name people, we name them just because we kind of like the sound of the name. That's ultimately why we give that person their name. For example, uh, my name is Brian. Brian's Irish meaning is high or noble. When my parents named me, they didn't think one day he will be Sir Brian, nobility. <laughs> we will name him Brian because he will be a noble gentleman of the court. No. I'll tell you why they named me Brian. My dad, his name is Bruce Goddard McMillan III. And a lot of thirds, not a lot, but some get the unfortunate nickname of Trip for Triple. My dad's Trip. Been trip his whole life because he's Bruce Goddard McMillan the third. Well, when I was still a fetus growing in my mother, people would come up and rub her belly, which why do people do that to pregnant women? No one wants that. <clears throat> and they'd come up and they just unannounced, you know, uninvited, just touch her stomach. And they, they would say, I can't wait for baby quad. My nickname before I was born was Quad because they were going to name me Bruce Goddard McMillan the fourth. My mom's like, oh no, I am not having a quad. Thank you, mom, by the way. I appreciate that. And so they changed my name and said to Brian Goddard McMillan so that I didn't have to be a quad. There is no deeper meaning to Brian than that. Like that was it. They just liked the name. It kind of had a B, Goddard McMillan. My, young, my oldest son is Brady Goddard McMillan. We kept that part going. She just didn't want a quad. But not so with God. His name 
isn't just a name. It's not just an identifier. It's not just something we're like casual about. When David says in Psalm 23, 3, God refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. His namesake. See, God's name combines his reputation, his identity with his holiness, his awesomeness is all there within his namesake. You see, we can come to God as father, like a child, relational, like dad. But don't forget in that that we can never still lose the hallowed be your name the holiness of his name, the majesty of his name. When you are praying, you are coming before the God of heaven whose seraphim are around him singing holy, holy, holy. There is one thing that in the contemporary church like ours that we can easily lose. It's the majesty of God. We have to remember it. We have to acknowledge it. We need to be in awe of our God. We stress the relationship as we should, but we can never lose the hallowed be your name. Because he is set apart. I'd go as far as to say that we are not worthy of saying his name. Yet he wants to have a relationship with us and he wants us to call to him and to speak his name. He's inviting us in. That's the only reason we do what we get to do. Because he, as our heavenly father says, you are my son and my daughter, call on my name. It's him who initiates. Friends, if you are never in awe of God, then I don't think you understand who he is. If you're never in awe, if you've just made him so simplistic and so down to earth and just, he's just your bro, then then, then I think you forget how awesome our God is, that his name is above every name, that nothing can compare to God, that he's not just a God, he is the God, the only God, the only one who spoke the entire universe into existence. He is God who goes beyond our comprehension, beyond what a finite being can fathom. He is God who created the entire solar system. That is the God in whom we serve. That is our God. (laughs) Be in awe of him. Be in awe of hallowed be his name. I I don't know if this is grammatically correct or not, but if you've never hallowed his name, then you're doing something wrong. And I don't think that's a proper English way of using it, but I'm using it because I'm in charge right now. (laughs) No English teachers there can tell me otherwise. Hallow his name. (laughs) It's like your name is holy you are God, we worship you, we praise you. Hallowed be his name. And on the other side of keeping God's name holy, I was thinking about this. This actually came to me in a Thursday service. It wasn't in my notes originally, but as I got to this point in the message on Thursday, I I realized that that if we were to keep his name holy and how precious and how how unique and how beautiful it is, I, I started thinking about how Not only are we casual about his name sometimes, but I I started realizing, man, there are times that it breaks the heart of God that as Christians, we actually use his name in vain. That we even abuse his name. I mean, how many times, and maybe this is part of your your vocabulary, you know how, how we all have just like phrases that we say all the time. Maybe you're a like person. You're like, oh, hey, like this, like that. You just say like all the time. I've often heard how people do that just with the name of God. Like something happens, oh God, oh God. You're just, just an oh God person. You're just so casual with just the, the name God. Like hear me, church. I, I want this to be a defining moment maybe for some of us. You don't just take the Lord's name casually. You don't just say, oh God, that's done. You need to, you need to get that in your head. Like no, I'm, that is not hallowed be thy name. 
That's irreverent. That's disrespectful. Let alone if you're angry and use the name Jesus Christ as a swear word, that's atrocious. GD, like never. I don't care if someone drops the F-bomb, don't say GD around me. You know what I'm saying? Like don't, don't take the Lord's name as a swear word. I mean, the, the third commandment of the 10 commandments, Exodus 27, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. It is a good thing he is our heavenly father. Or, and I know this doesn't happen this way, but if I were him, I'd be lightning bolting people all the time. I'm like, what'd you just say? Boom. I mean, I'm so thankful that his grace is his grace and his love is his love, but, but we're just, we're so irreverent at times and disrespectful to our God in the way that we use his name. It's heartbreaking. And listen, the culture's gonna do what the culture will do. I'm not saying go around every time your coworker says like, Jesus Christ, you're like, well, do you know? Like, yeah, it's probably not gonna get you anywhere. Probably not gonna bring him to a moment of salvation, but for you and your mind and your lips, Make sure the only time you use the words of God or Jesus or whatever, it's a position of hallowed be your name. Respect, honor, (laughs) holiness in that. Does that make sense? Holy be your name. And this is the starting place, friends, of prayer. It's all about God. It's not about us. And by the way, saying hallowed be your name also means that since we know how holy he is, that we turn our hearts to him, that we obey him, that we serve him, that we live for him. If, if there isn't even a desire when we pray to live a godly life, then I don't think you're actually praying to God. I think you're praying to a genie. I think you're praying to a mythological being that you've created Because if we're really praying to God and and we're saying your name is holy, Heavenly Father, you are holy, then there has to be something in us that starts to say, well, then I I know God says that we are to be holy because he is holy. Jesus tells us that. So so then I need to desire more holiness in my life. Our prayer life, as we talked about last week, should be part of what starts to shape more of a holiness desire within us because we're connecting to God in the first place. I'm not saying you can't come to him when you're broken. I'm, I, some of the, the times I've cried out to God the most in my life are after I've, I've fallen and sinned and I, I've just, I, I couldn't believe what I have done. And I'm not saying those aren't the moments you should come to him. They, they're definitely the moments you should go to him. But even in that, it's kind of a, God, help me and help me to be godlier. Help me to be like you've called for me to be. But I don't think you can say hallowed be your name time after time and not be willing to grow in holiness yourself. Because that's not hallowed be his name. That's, I'm gonna make you up to how I want you to be. But if God is God, then there's gotta be a desire in us to say, then I, I wanna be God the way you want me to be because you are so holy. Friends, when we come to him in prayer, we need to make prayer first about him. Let me close by just bringing this back to my life and my wife's broken foot for a moment. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I have never been this attentive to my wife's needs ever in my life. I'm not even going to pretend like after she birthed kids, I was like, all right, rest up champ. <laughs> like we got this right. You know, I, <laughs> just being honest, like, you know, she's tough. We're both independent. That's why we work so well. You know, I'm alpha, she's alpha. We're just alphaing our lives, doing our thing. Like that's, that's been our deal since the beginning. Like, you know, we get together, we work together, but we're very independent people. But all of a sudden with her foot being as broken as it is and her not being able to put any pressure on it, things have quickly changed. And so suddenly I'm attentive, Brian, and she's never seen this version of me. <clears throat> And I think it's starting to freak her out. You know, every time she looks around, I'm right by her like, are you okay? Do you need anything? Are you all right right now? Are you good? And she's like, I'm in the bathroom, safe on a toilet. Leave me alone. I don't need you here. Like, just go already. I'm like, okay, are you sure? All right. If I hear any noises, I'll be right in, okay? I mean, it used to be I'd wake up in the morning and the first thing I would think about is me. <laughs> I'm like, I get home from work and the first thing I would care about is my emotional needs. 
And as I would go to bed at night, I would go to bed thinking, what do I need for me to be good for me in the morning? Like, that's, that's me. And suddenly, things are flipped completely upside down to the point that before I do anything for myself, I'm checking in on her. She even asked me and had me take nail polish off her feet the other day. <laughs> I hate feet people. (laughs) Hate feet. The Bible talks about foot washing. I'm like, give me grace on that one, God. That's all you. I'm going to leave that to a different culture. I'm not washing anyone's feet. I'm going to take off nail polish. Never done that before. Well, (laughs) mani-pedi. Pray for me, friends. I say all that because... I've been checking on her needs before my own. I've been making her the priority because I'm worried about her. Here's the thing when it comes to prayer. Prayer must be about us coming to God and making our prayers first and foremost about him before we make it about us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. We align ourselves to his greatness and his majesty knowing what it is to honor him, to make it about our heavenly father. And then as we set the stage of his grandeur, now knowing he can do all things because we've acknowledged it, we take the next step in our time of prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Join us next week as we pray through that. Will you stand with me as I close this in prayer? God, I want to thank you for sending your son Jesus who took on flesh, lived a sinless life, died on a cross for our sin so that we could have a relationship with the holy God call you father that never could have happened without the sacrifice of Jesus which is probably why in the Old Testament it was just unconceivable because the sin had not yet been forgiven the relationship had not yet been restored and so we praise you that we can call you father that you are our dad you are Abba father and we can come before you as your children adopted into your family and as we do that may we also step back And see the majesty of our God, the grandeur of our God, the power, the knowledge, all that you are. May we be in awe of you. And I do just want to take a moment to maybe have a clean slate in this room for our church. I want to repent on behalf of our congregation as a whole. For every time that we didn't take your name as holy. And for every time that any of us have said the Lord's name in vain, we've said the Lord's name as a a swear, that we've desecrated it instead of making it holy. Right now, collectively, can we just say, God, forgive us. (laughs) Forgive us. Just, Lord, I pray that there will be a humility upon our hearts and that we leave here with a new knowledge that that that's not just a casual thing that that is acceptable, but as the people of God, may may from our lips only glorify your name and never put it down. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. And all God's people said, Amen. amen, amen.